Hello everybody and welcome back to Environmental Science 101. Here we do aquatic ecosystems, including, yes, these things, the reefs. Okay, so back up. We might remember talking about air circulation, right? And global air circulation and how that sort of trickles down, right, to other more specific areas, right? Okay, we can do the same thing with ocean. All right, to be clear, um, a lot of what is going on with our ocean as far as how the currents flow, how the water moves, is directly influenced by the wind, which blows and by friction causes things to circulate in a way that will be very familiar with us if we were familiar with air circulation, right? So the starting place, right? And we don't have to know all the details on this. This particular slide, we can be along for the ride. Okay, we start here, right? It's hot. We're at the equator, right? Wind is blowing from east to west, right? And it takes water with it, right? Moves from east to west, right? It has to kind of flow around Australia. It has to flow around Asia as a landmass. It has to flow in between Africa and Antarctica because there's no way to go through here, right? Comes, hits South America. It's forced upwards instead of through this tiny gap, right? Comes all the way up and then melts a bunch of ice here in Greenland. And as it melts that ice, it cools off the water. It lowers the salinity which lowers the density as well, as we'll see, and it sinks all the way down to the bottom, right? So there's like a top current going, which is warm, and there's a bottom current that kind of comes back, right? Bottom current sinks all the way down, right? Comes back, hits Antarctica, and gets caught in this thing called the circumantarctic current, right? Which flows actually around all of Antarctica through the whole world, right? Comes through here, some of it comes up, gets warmed up through the Indian Ocean, and the big land mass is here, right? Gets a bunch of sun and comes up. Some of it continues past Australia up into the body of the Pacific, right? Hits the equator, keeps going north, gets warmed up, and does the whole thing again. This is not the East Australian current for those familiar, but it's close. We'll see it. Okay. In more detail, which is not critical, right? But let's just look at this. Okay. So we have these rotating things called gyres, all right? So We've got wind, which blows from east to west, right? And so from east to west along the equator, right? And this induces some circulation here, right? Induces circulation in the opposite direction, right? You notice that there's a total of five of these circulating cells called the five major gyres, right, of the world. Um, one in each ocean, roughly speaking. Don't quote me on that, right? Uh, this is our famous Gulf Stream, right, which carries warm water up through, well, the Bahamas all the way to Europe, right, and is considered a major climate change tipping point. Um, if this thing stops taking warm water up here to England, then, okay, let's think about it, right? England up here is the same latitude as, like, the middle of Canada, all right? The reason why the weather in England is not the way that it is in the middle of Canada is because this Gulf Stream brings warm water up. If that stops happening, and it could, that's going to be a problem. Anyway, on a happier note, um, this is our warm East Australian current here. Okay, so we talked about how fresh water is going to sink, right? If we go back, right? Once you get Greenland, you melt off a bunch of stuff because it's really warm water coming in, right? Water comes in, it causes the water to get colder, which makes it denser and it sinks, right? But it also causes it to become fresher, less salty, which also causes it to sink. This is going to be important. Right. We know that the oceans are salt water, right? And that other things are fresh water, like lakes or rivers, right? But it's also important to emphasize just how different these are, right? Uh, we talked about hardness, right? And the amount of hardness, right? How, you know, something like one or 200 parts per million would be considered really high hardness, right? With salt water, right, in the ocean, it's going to be way bigger, like 10 to 100 times more stuff, right? Ions, minerals, little pieces in there are going to be dissolved in the ocean compared to even the hardest, most minerally fresh water. Okay, it's a big number. Um, as a fun fact, um, if you're ever making pasta, right, maybe you do this already, throw a bunch of salt in before you start to boil it, right? It'll boil much better, turn out much better in the end, and as you do that, right, you will induce a higher boiling point for the water. Suck more stuff out. It's great. Make it as salty as seawater. You will never regret it. Um, the salt in the oceans is coming from the land, right? From minerals on land. Carried in through rivers and leached out through other processes. It's taken out when it's laid down, but we don't really care about that part, which is fine. Terrestrial setting. All right, so terra means earth, right? 
See, these are going to be aquatic settings that are kind of on land, or more on land than they are not. Okay, we got lakes, wetlands, and caves. So we'll start with lakes, which hopefully we have all been to at one time or another. It's no judgment if you haven't. Okay, so these tend to be fairly still, right? Not a lot of circulation. We might remember when we talked about dissolved oxygen that circulation is really important to keep oxygen levels high, right? As a result, it is extremely common for life to just kind of be in the shallow parts and the top parts. Two reasons for this, right? Those tend to be better circulated and moved around by wind, right? As opposed to the bottom, which can get boggy and anoxic. And because uh, sunlight does not penetrate all the way to the bottom of every lake, all right? Sunlight is going to penetrate down, well, let's say 30 to 100 meters max. I'll put the exact figure in a note, right? As a result, right, we're going to get most of the life around the edges in the shallower parts. And these lakes can be extremely deep, extremely big, maybe much more so than we are expecting, right? So just as a kind of reference, all right, um, we've got our ocean here, right? We've got our great lakes, right, which might be a thousand feet deep. Then the deepest lake in the world, which is in this rift valley that has been pulled open and then filled in with water in Russia, can be up to 5,000 feet. All right. So just for reverence, right, we said that maybe sunlight could penetrate something like 100 meters, right? So 100 meters here would be like the top 5% of it, right? So this is the part that life mostly lives in. It's concentrated up here. The rest of the stuff, you got less and less and less life colder, less sunlight, go to mirror conditions in the deep ocean. Though to be clear, the ocean is a lot deeper. Like it would be two and a half of these things put together, like if my mouse just keep going down. Okay, got it. We have some sense of scale on how deep lakes are compared to the ocean. Cool. Wetlands. So really, this is going to be way more important than lakes, way more important than caves for all sorts of reasons. Primarily, this is going to come down to our ecosystem services of regulating, acting as a buffer against storms, uh, being able to filter out harsh contaminants in the environment, right? Any water that passes through here, some of the bad stuff, the nasty stuff you don't want, it's going to get taken up by plants and pulled out, right? And sort of uh, removed from the system, right? And supporting, right? Providing primary production, like plants and oxygen and carbon and biomass that you need to support other ecosystems. Awesome. These are hugely important. They also commonly get drained on mass and then developed, which ends up being a problem eventually. All right. This is just an area of land that is saturated with water saturated here, which we might have seen when we talked about groundwater saturated just means full, like you cannot put any more water in there. All right. It's filled with water. This is going to be a broad term, all right? And it's not exactly a perfect term, right? But it's going to include all these other terms that maybe we have heard elsewhere, right? So marshes, mudflats, mires, fin, bogs, which I believe one is one pH and one is another. I'll put it in the note. Swamps, lagoons, floodplains, all right? All of these are going to be wetlands, all right? Hugely important, diverse, lots of life there, very important, easily damaged, often drained. Okay, caves are going to be the last one. We'll kind of speed run it. Okay, so water comes down, right? We know that it infiltrates and sinks into the ground. In some places, the bedrock in the ground dissolves whenever you hit it with water. I mean, especially things like limestone. So water comes in, starts dissolving it, and you end up with these massive holes. And this is going to cause natural sinkholes. It's the same process, right? Um, these tend to have less biodiversity, but they have unique and interesting things. This is essentially uh, ecology that has been pushed to extremes, and so you have life that develops especially in dark caves, which is completely blind, and which does not live like anything else in the world. It tends to be very unique. So these tend to farm in areas that are dominated by limestone, calcium carbonate, which we've talked about with carbon sequestration and other sources. Caves tend to form nearby other caves. Why? Because bedrock is made of limestone. Extremely common. I mean, the entire state of Florida is basically made of limestone and the bedrock, and so you get a lot of caves down there and related things. South China also is a beautiful area, a lot of caves, very common for shooting things like movies once you learn to recognize it. Okay, marine stuff is going to be most of it. So we have our continental shelves right around the edges of the continents. Uh, I'm going to sort of fast forward through this though for now, make sure we have plenty of time. Okay, 
Beaches and inner tidal are going to be the first. Have a lot of life here. I always think about going to California, go to the beach, right? And you have these rocky zones where the tide comes in, tide comes out. A lot of life in between, right? Especially in these little puddles. People bring their dogs even though they're not supposed to. And, you know, you got starfish, sea urchins, snails, and all sorts of other things in here tend to be more shelly. Um, as opposed to stuff that's lower down that tends to be a little bit softer. Very important, rich in life, right? Gets tied sometime, other times no tide. Perfect. Estuary is going to be these things that are like at the intersection, right? Of fresh water coming in through the river, salt water here in the ocean, all right? Where they be, you've got an estuary. So that combination of kind of fresh and kind of salt water is called brackish water. Be a good term to know. Here's a real world example. These are great for bird life. If birds existed and were real, they would love it here. Lots of biodiversity, tons of nutrients that come in from both of those sides. It kind of is a meeting place of all the worlds, has a lot of things we want. These things, right, bays, harbors, inlets, and lagoons, they're not really types of estuaries, but let's just say that they're types of estuaries, all right? They're all going to fall into this category. Cool. Shallow ocean is going to be the most important, right? Both now and through all of Earth's history. Most of the life is going to be here, right? So we've got our continent, right, all the way here. And we've got our deep ocean here. But there's some stuff in the middle where you have shallow water. It tends to be broad, flat. This thing is the continental shelf, right? So it extends past the edge of the continents is what I'm trying to get across with this one, right? You've got the continent itself, and then you've got these shelves that extend outward. Incredibly rich areas for life. It is shallow enough that sunlight can penetrate all the way to the bottom. You get tons of production here. Nutrients flowing in from the continents. Water is shallow enough. You get reefs that build up right here on the edge and block stuff from the deep ocean from coming in and messing everything up. There's also something poetic about it for people who appreciate that, right? Most of the life now and in the past is going to develop right here in shallow, warm, tropical waters right where the land meets the sea. It works. And this is where you get limestone deposited, right? Stuff here dies. Their shells, which are made out of calcium carbonate, sink to the bottom. Pile up, get cemented into rock, bam, we got limestone. Cool. This is good. It takes carbon out of the atmosphere. Okay, deep ocean is going to be the last one. Oceans are about 4,000 meters, right? Four kilometers deep. So about 2.5 miles. This is a lot, right? Uh, deepest ocean is about 11 kilometers in the Marianas Trench. Uh, there are these things. So seamounts are like underwater volcanoes. Volcanic islands can pile up. This is uh, Hawaii here. The abyssal plain, right? Abyss because it's empty. Plain because it's nice and flat at the bottom of the ocean. Here's our continental shelf for scale, right? There's this other thing called the continental slope as a transition. Awesome. We got it. We're smart. We got no light down here, right? You need light to photosynthesize, so there's not going to be a lot of production. You got other crazy things that learn to exist down here in the cold where there's no light, right? This is our anglerfish. Really interesting from an evolutionary perspective. You ask, okay, why don't these fish develop what they need to be able to run away just like our characters? The answer is that being smart takes too much money in evolutionary terms. There's no better explanation than that, I swear. Things down here tend to be like slow growing and weird and blind and unique, just like with our caves. Another unique place down here is going to be our hydrothermal vents. Extremely hot, like hundreds of degrees C, right? 350, right? This is a black smoker here, black smoker up here that we're looking at. Why is it black? Because the hot stuff, right? So water comes in through these cracks, right? It's drawn towards the magma, it circulates, right? It gets heated up and then rushes back up and out, leaches minerals out of the rocks in the meantime. And so that's water with tons of minerals. It's really hot coming out. Extremely hot, rich, not single. Water circulates above our hot magma source, dissolves, leaches minerals out. Possibly this is thought to be one of the places on Earth where life emerged through this process of chemosynthesis using methane sulfur compounds prior to photosynthesis. I put the process here. It's a work in progress, but maybe. You have unique ecosystems there that are not seen elsewhere on Earth. Awesome. So that covers aquatic ecosystems. Next we do pollution, and then we're done.